So uh, before I start, I'm going to read a text. <laughs> um, I wasn't being rude when the dean was talking. I was actually reading text from my wife. So um, yesterday, actually, I flew here yesterday, and the day before that was my 27th wedding anniversary. So um, I feel like I'm on fire today because uh, I have been since my anniversary. Um, as a writer, I'm not home very often. And uh, we have four children. We live on a farm in Virginia. And um, <clears throat> I made it a habit years ago when we started having kids, our oldest is 19, um, to take them with me when I travel. It's unusual for me to be here and not have one of them with me. Uh, because I'm not home that often, I, I try to always go somewhere with one of my kids. I actually get more time with my kids than most fathers because when I am with them, it's one-on-one -on -one and there's nothing else. Um, when you're home, it's you, all of you parents know it's chaos and it's hard to divide up time. And, um, but anyways, uh, for my anniversary two days ago, uh, I had come from Philadelphia because I was there Monday night to cover the Monday night game. Um, we, I got home Tuesday and Wednesday was my anniversary. And uh, took the day off and we had like one of the funnest days of our lives. And it was a simple day, but it was a great day. And yesterday when I was on the airplane coming out here, uh, I was texting my wife saying goodbye from the runway. And uh, she texted me back and said, thanks for being my best friend. You've been my best friend for 27 years. That's why I'm on fire. <laughs> it's like, when you get a text like that, it's like, uh, it makes um, life really good. Uh, and it makes me, want to go to work and, uh, and do the job that I have, uh, which is a great job that I never imagined I'd do. Um, I've never taken a writing class in my life. Um, I didn't study journalism. Um, I studied American history in college. I studied politics in graduate school, and then I went to law school. Uh, so no one ever taught me how to write, um, which is why I love Ben Franklin's biography so much, where he uh, dropped out of school at age 10 and started working in a, on a printing press and taught himself to write and became uh, such a fabulous writer um, and invented newspapers and magazines. I love that about him. And I've been fortunate as a journalist to, um, to be doing this now for 20 years, working for myself, but getting to work with a lot of great media companies in America. And where I wanted to start today, because I'm going to tell you some fast stories, and I'm going to keep a close eye on the clock. Uh, the stories that I've picked to illustrate today are themes that Jeff uh, and I uh, discussed through email that we thought would be great for the conference. Um, there's some themes that I've developed over years working in journalism, and a lot of you, because I know most of you probably come from a similar faith background, these are themes that will probably resonate with some of your personal beliefs. Um, but I think they're, they're themes that are portable, that work, they work in your home, uh, they work in your job, they work in life, um, and uh, I apply them when I go to work. And the first one is, um, it has to do with judgment. It's very important in my job that um, when I start stories that I, uh, I just have a hard, fast rule that I never judge the people that I'm going to write about. Uh, usually I know things about them before I decide to write about them or try to write about them. And some of the things you know may not be flattering around the surface, you think, um, you think you may know where the story is going to go or what this person is like, but I've learned through experience that usually that's wrong. And um, the last thing that I can do, because as a journalist I need, if I were going to write about you, for example, and I really wanted you to let me in, I, I need to start developing a trust relationship with you the first time we talk. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, the fastest way to kill that possibility is if when you look at me, you think that in my eyes, I'm judging you. If that happens, then we're dead before we start. You're never going to go with me where I want you to go. I want you to go someplace that you've never gone with anyone else um, and tell me things you've never told anyone else and um, so that what we finish in the end is really compelling. And when people read it, they go, wow, I learned something. This is, this is different than stuff I've read. Takes us to here. Uh, this boy on the right, you're right. You're right is named Alfonso Marsh. A uh, great high school football player from Compton, California, who was recruited by the University of Utah by Coach Whittingham and actually went to Utah 
his freshman year. He was shot in a drive-by shooting during his freshman year at Utah. Uh, he's now at Weber. Um, I'll tell you how I met Alfonso. That's his high school coach next to him. Uh, five, four and a half years ago, I did a story for Sports Illustrated about criminal records in college football. And I worked with five of my partners there. Uh, and basically, we did criminal background checks on about 2,500 players. These were all the players who filled the rosters of the top 25 teams in the college football preseason poll, the Sports Illustrated preseason top 25 poll. So we took those 25 teams, we printed the rosters, and we spent six months doing criminal background checks on every player. And we found out how many players in the top 25 had a criminal record. It was a, a, an amazing revelation for us. And we wrote a cover story about it. As soon as the story came out, like literally the next day, I got a phone call from a criminologist, a professor at the University of South Carolina who has a partner at the University of Arizona. They study crime and crime data. And they had just finished uh, doing a three-year study on uh, the influence of gangs in college football recruiting. And basically what they'd done is they'd gone to all these schools and they had confidentiality agreements and they tracked how many gang members had been recruited by college football programs in the Division I. It was revelatory, but it was very academic. It was the kind of stuff that probably nobody would read except uh, academics in that field. However, if it were written a different way, it's the kind of thing that could actually get a lot of ink if it were in a, like a publication like Sports Illustrated. And that's why he called me. He'd seen the, our story, and he thought, would you be interested in looking at ours and maybe writing something about it in the magazine? So he sent it to me, an advanced copy. I read it. I took it to my editor and I said, you know, I don't know if there's anything we can do with this guy's stuff, but you know, it would be really interesting for us to maybe work with these professors and have them be like experts and consultants that we could interview and feature in our story and we could certainly refer to their research in our story, but let's go out and find some kids who are actually in a, in a gang infested area and see what it's like to be them and how strong is the lure to join a gang versus to play football. And so all the gang experts we talked to in the country said, go to Compton, Compton, California. Because Southern California, Texas, and Florida are the three uh, largest recruiting grounds for college, Division I college football in America. That's where the most college football players come from, California, Texas, and Florida. So in those three states, we looked, where's the best intersection between college football recruiting and gangs? It's South Central LA. So we went to Compton. Alfonso plays for a, a high school called Dominguez High School, and anybody from the LA area knows that Dominguez is one of three big high schools in Compton. We made arrangements with Alfonso's coach to come and spend some time, I made arrangements to go spend some time with Dominguez High, and our first start on this project was to go to one of their games against crosstown rival Compton High. And so um, we went to uh, Compton, I uh, met Alfonso, um, Liked him instantly, very quiet, um, fatherless. That's his mom. She died while I was writing the story. Um, the kid really on the edge. You can see it in his eyes. This was our escort. Sergeant Dean is the uh, head of the gang unit in Compton. Um, that's my partner, Armin Katayan. We wrote the system together. The system was an outgrowth of this story at Sports Illustrated. Uh, Armin's a correspondent for 60 Minutes and CBS News. We're longtime friends, and we partner on a lot of stuff. And um, so I was writing the cover story for Sports Illustrated, and he was producing a CBS piece. They were going to be companions on this story. Sergeant Dean uh, put us in one of their patrol cars. We mounted a camera to the dashboard, and he drove us through the worst parts of Compton so we could really learn quickly what we were dealing with. Um, Sergeant Dean was great. Just If we ever made a movie, this guy could play himself. Um, uh, so the day that they, Alfonso's team was playing Dominguez, I went to Compton High School. Compton was the home team, so Dominguez is riding a bus across town to play Compton. Uh, I've had no contact with Compton, just that they happen to be the home team. Uh, we showed up in the afternoon. The game was starting at 5. We showed up at 3. The, sta the stadium was empty. There was nobody there. It was a sunny, typical sunny, warm September day in Southern California. 
What wasn't typical was when we showed up at the field, the entire sports complex was surrounded by these high uh, iron black bars. It looked like a prison. I'd never seen a high school field that you couldn't get into because it was like guarded. And I was like, what is going on here? This is ridiculous. I mean, I literally couldn't find a way into the football field. I couldn't get in. And I was like, this is weird. And I finally found a guy who unlocked a, a gate and let me in. I just wanted to walk around the track and kind of look around. And uh, while I was doing that, these guys walked out of the locker room. Now, they weren't in full pads at the time, but they had their football pants on. And, uh, but they were shirtless, most of them up top, because they were coming out to stretch and stuff. This was way before the game. The other team hadn't showed up. No fans in the stands yet. So I started going up to guys and saying, hey, um, hi, my name is Jeff Benedict, and I'm a writer for Sports Illustrated, and I'm here to cover your game tonight. Can I ask you a few questions? And you know, the kids usually would talk to you. And, and um, I'd ask them, the first thing I'd ask all of them was, so, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And um, you don't have to be smart to guess what, what they all said. What do they want to be? They want to be pro football players. And none of them will. But that's what they all want to be. Then I got to this kid right here, the kid in the center of the screen. And I said, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, a lawyer. I did what you just did. I said, oh, OK, that's different. And I said, uh, where do you want to go to law school? He wanted to go to Harvard. And I said, how are your grades? And he said, my grades are good. How good? Like, you know, 3.8. Um, he said, are you being recruited by anyone? He said, I'm being recruited by Harvard, Columbia, Yale, Stanford. Wow. That's really different. And so uh, I said, have you ever been tempted to join a gang? And he said, no. Um, I said, well, why not? And he said, well, because my father would kill me if I ever did that. <laughs> and I could tell he wasn't saying it like a joke. His father used to be in the Crips. So he meant it. He was very serious about it. And I said, is your dad going to be at the game tonight? He said, my dad is at every game. And I said, well, where would I find your dad? He said, well, he'll be with my mom. <laughs> and the reason this is revelatory is because none of the other boys have dads. So there are no dads sitting with moms. I mean, that's what the coach told me. That's what Alfonso's coach said. He said, all my guys, he says, I'm their dad. Well, so my guys don't have dads. And so I'm the only thing between them and a gang. I'm trying to get them to go here. Gangs are trying to get them to go over there. And most of them don't have a dad at home. And so this guy, he's got a dad at home. So I go to um, the game starts, and I am probably the only white person in the stands. There's a lot of people in the stands. because It's a big high school. There's 3,000 students there. And um, I'm working my way through the bleachers. I'm trying to find a guy named Katam Ham Sr. Because his son is Katam Ham Jr. And I'm asking him, do, do you know a guy named Katam? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but nobody knows where he is. And everyone's looking at me like, who's this fruitcake walking <laughs> through the stands who clearly doesn't belong here and isn't from here? And uh, I finally found, it took me most of the first quarter to find him. I'm supposed to be there to watch the game. I haven't watched one play. And uh, I finally found Katam Ham Sr. and his wife, Donietta, and they were sitting in the front row on the opposite end of the bleachers that I started on. And um, <laughs> so when I found him, uh, you've, you've all been at sporting events. The bleachers are like this. They're raised. And so I, I literally came down the bleachers, and they were in the front row. And so it's this thing, right? This is not a good way to talk to people when you're trying to make an introduction. It's just not, not natural. You know, it's like you're forcing people to do that. And so I had my little reporter's notebook. I had a, a recorder in my pocket, but it wasn't on. But I just had a little pad and just, just kind of a thing. You know, I came down and I knelt down and I introduced myself. So now we're at eye level and I told him who I was and I said, I met your son um, prior to the game. I had a really interesting conversation. And I said, I'm here to write a story about, you know, whatever. But 
I'm interested in write, maybe writing a story about your son. Can I ask you some questions? And so he looks at his wife. That's a good sign. And his wife gives the OK. And so we got into it, and we started talking. And uh, I learned that when Katam Ham Sr. was 13 years old, he joined a gang. And, uh, and then uh, he got the woman that was sitting next to him pregnant when she was 15. And then she had the baby when she was 16. And then he went to jail. And then he got out of jail, and they had three more kids. And by the time she was 21, they had, three, they had four kids. Katam Jr. was the last one. And they weren't married. And he had no job, and he had a criminal record, and he was tied to a gang. That's the start. That's where this story starts. So that's what I mean about why, if you make a judgment right there, you go, this is not going to end well, right? There's no way this story ends well. Um, yet, I'm looking at them, and they tell me now they've been married now for over 20 years, never been with anybody else. Their four kids are grown. Katam's the last one. He's a senior in high school, being recruited by Ivy League schools. Their three daughters are grown. They all had, did great in Compton High School. They're, going, or they're in college. Uh, they're productive citizens. They're a tight family. They belong to a church. Katam Ham Sr. left the gang when he was 20, never went back. So I said, well, um, we exchange phone numbers. I called my editor from the game after the game, and I said, I, I want to do a different story. I want to do a story on Katam Ham. I told him what I just told you. And he said, if you can get them to cooperate, let's see what they can do. So I called them when I got home, and I said, I want to, I want to come back. I want to, I want to go to Compton High School with your son. I'd like to be a student with him and see what it's like to be him. I want to walk in his shoes. Um, we don't usually write stories about minors in the magazine. It's very rare you'd put a minor on the cover of the magazine. There's a lot of risks with doing that. Um, she said, well, how do we do that? I said, well, I, I literally want to like, do everything he does. I want to go to school with him. I want to wake up with him in the morning. I want to you know, sleep at your house. You know, I want to. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, we have a really tiny, it's just an apartment. It's, uh, you know, it's Compton. We don't have much. She said, I don't know, where would you want to sleep? And I said, I, you know, I know this will sound weird, but I want to sleep in your son's bedroom. And I want, to, I want to watch him go to bed at night. I want to see what he does. And I want to watch him wake up in the morning. So that cot right there, she got that cot. Those are my bags. That's my cot. And that's Katam's bed. That's his room. I went out there and moved in. And... Uh, I watched him go to bed at night. I watched what he did. I watched him sit on that bed for two hours and do homework, write an essay with earbuds in his ears. And I sat on that cot and just watched him. At one point, I said, hey, <laughs> took the earbuds out. I said, what are you listening to? Now, if I pulled you guys, I, I, there's, there's not a guy, there's not a person in this room that would guess the right answer to what he's listening to. You're all wrong. Because you're all stereotyped to think what he's listened to. And it's not what you think. No, it's not the Mormon Tabernacle Choir either. <laughs> but it's not rap music. It's not R&B. It's none of that. It's uh, Rascal Flats. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I don't even listen to Rascal Flats. <laughs> he was listening to Rascal Flats. And then his mom came in. Uh, told him it was time to turn the light out, looked at his homework, told him she loved him, and he turned the light out after he set his alarm on his iPhone. I laid on that cot in the dark and just was like, wow, you know, this is unbelievable. There's an alley outside that window. I live on a farm. It's very quiet. The most noise you might hear is the neighbor's cow at night, and we don't even usually hear that. Um, this was like noise all night, car alarms, dogs, fights, police cars, just, you know, I didn't sleep much. He slept like a baby because he's used to it. So he didn't hear any of it. I heard all of it. And so naturally, I was awake at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'd already been awake for a long time and just laying there waiting for his alarm to go off. I watched him wake up, press his alarm, and get up, pick out his clothes, and then walk down the hall in the dark to the kitchen, which is just around the corner from the bedroom. I said, what are you doing? I'm following him around. What are you doing? And he said, I'm going to iron my clothes. And I said, do you do that every morning? And he said, I do it every day. 
I ironed my clothes before school. Who taught you how to iron? My mother taught me how to iron. And then his dad drove him to school, drove us to school. And, um, <laughs> and I went to school with him. And, uh, and I did everything he does. I went to all his classes. I went to English class where they were teaching these kids how to write. <laughs> and I thought, I, I can help you there. Um, but, it, but I was just there to watch. And um, uh, that's him and I at school, Compton High School. Katam and I became really good friends. I really like this kid. I like his family. I wrote that story. And um, we picked that. You know, there's a movie out right now called Straight Outta Compton. Straight Outta Compton was, a, was an intense, uh, record that came out of Compton that would never be allowed to be played on this campus. It's, uh, it's about life in Compton. And now there's a movie out about it that's been very controversial this summer. We decided to play off that in our story and show you that there's, there's another story coming straight out of Compton. It's this story about this kid and this family. It's a great story that you'd never know if you didn't get in their shoes and walk around for a while and realize, frankly, that what they've done, it's a lot more impressive than what most people do who, you know, their kids are all going off and going to school and doing all these great things in their lives, but they don't have the hurdles to get over that these guys have. They don't have the obstacles. When the father takes the son to play basketball in the local neighborhood at age 13, there's probably not a father in this room that's ever been on a basketball court with his son in the neighborhood and had to grab his son and pull him back when, a, when another guy pulls out a semi-automatic weapon on the, on, the, on the basketball court and he's ready to shoot someone. I mean, that's how this kid grew up. And now he's uh, been to college and he's becoming a police officer. Uh, and he will be a great one. When I finished that, I read in the New York Times, not in the sports page, but in the religion section, that there was a kid in Chicago who was African American, a great basketball player, and uh, would be potentially in, in Mormon. Uh, I'd never heard of Jabari Parker at that point, and I, I was interesting to me to be reading about him in the New York Times religion page. Some smart writer who writes religion stories heard about him. And I read it and thought, wow, uh, he could be the first African American Mormon drafted into the NBA. So I convinced my editor to let me do the same thing with him that I did with Katam, which was follow him around for a year. So I went to Chicago. I approached Jabari's parents and did the same thing. I said, I want to go to school with Jabari. I want to do, just, I want to do the same thing. It's just, I just want to do it again with another teenager. So two teenagers on the cover. Um, Jabari, uh, this story, ultimately, uh, while we were writing it, when we were almost done, so the cover story wasn't out yet, I had a meeting with the editor-in-chief of Sports Illustrated. We were talking about what was going to be in the story, and he stopped me. He goes, question, what? He says, is this kid going to go on a Mormon mission? I said, I don't know. He's only 17, so he doesn't have to decide that yet. I, I don't know what he's going to do. It's too early. He said, well, our readers are going to be wondering about that. You know, they're going to, they're going to wonder if he's going to go. And he said, so what I want you to do is... Um, I want you to interview Steve Young, and I want you to find out why he didn't go on a mission. And I want you to interview Danny Ainge and find out why he didn't go on a mission, and then find two prominent Mormon athletes who did go on a mission and find out why they went. And I want you to write a little sidebar story about inside the Jabari story. So I, the first person I called was Steve Young. I didn't know Steve. Steve and I both grew up in Connecticut along the coast, fairly close in time. He was, he was five years ahead of me in high school. So, and our high schools didn't play each other in football, so we wouldn't have met there either. But, but we actually grew up really close to each other. Connecticut's a really small state. And uh, he made my life easy, easier, because we both went to high schools where we were the only Mormon boy in our school. And, and back in Connecticut in the 70s and 80s when we were there, you know, Mormonism, you know, people knew two things about us. Um, lots of wives and, and black people don't get to do what white people do in the church. That's what my friends knew about us. That's all they knew. That's what I, that's what I grew up with. 
And uh, my best friend in school was black. My best friend. So that's me. And uh, the reason Steve made it easier is because when I was in high school, Steve was here, where he became an All-American. And when he started becoming a great football player and everybody knew he was a Mormon because he was Brigham Young's great, 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 great grandson, it made my life easier when I was in high school. So I always had an affection for Steve, but I'd never been in a position to express it to him, and that was a long time ago anyways. So I called him up about the Sports Illustrated story, and I said, hey, um, I told him why I wanted to talk to him. And I figured I knew the answer. This is what I mean about judgment. You don't know. You think you know, and you don't. I don't know why he didn't go on his mission. See, the guy's it's like Danny. Danny told me why he didn't go, and he's a great athlete. And there was an opportunity there, and it was his athleticism had something to do with that, and he said it had nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Turned into a 45-minute conversation, and at the end of the conversation, I said, whoa, that's a little more complicated than I would have ever imagined. Of course, I don't know him, so what do I know? And... Um, I promised him that I said, look, I, will, I can understand why you wouldn't want to have all this in Sports Illustrated, but this isn't a story about you anyways. I, I was supposed to get like a one-sentence quote from you and plug it in. <laughs> and I said, so I will write this, but before I show it to the magazine, I'll show it to you. And if you're not comfortable with it, I'll change it because I want you to be comfortable with it. That was our agreement. We were about to hang up the phone. He said, I have a question for you. And I said, what's that? He said, um, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I, you know, I never really kept a diary, and I, my kids never saw me play football. You know, I got married in my last year of my career. My children never seen me play. Um, I've been thinking for a long time. I need to get my life history written. Would you be interested in potentially writing it? And um, I, I mean, he couldn't see me because I was in my house, but I mean. I was like leaping around. I thought, what, a, what an amazing opportunity that would be. And so shortly thereafter, I went out to Palo Alto and met Steve. And I started then um, writing his life story while I was following Jabari Parker now through his freshman year at Duke. I had called Coach Krzyzewski. Well, actually, back up. I called Jabari when he, when he signed with Duke. I wrote, did the cover story about him in high school. Then I wrote another story for the magazine when he signed with Duke. And then I called him and, his, and I said, would you be willing to let me follow you through your freshman year at Duke? I knew he was only going to stay for one year. And he said he would do it if Coach K said it was OK. So I called Jabari's mom to see how she felt about it, because I wanted to get their blessing too. And she said yes, that they would definitely be go for that. And I said, there is one problem. I mean, Coach K has never let a journalist inside his basketball program in 34 years, because he doesn't trust us. And uh, I said, so he's probably not going to want to do this. And she said, I'll call Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so second thing, never judge. The second thing is you have to build trust. And the only reason Mike called me and said, what do you want to do, is because of the relationship he had with the Parkers and the relationship the Parkers had with me. And it was all built on trust. And he asked me what I wanted. I said, I just, want to, I just want to follow your star recruit through his freshman year at Duke. I want to watch your relationship with him. I want to see how it unfolds. I'd like to interview you four times over the course of the year and interview him four times over the course of the year. Come to some practices. Stay out of your way and go to your games. That's it. He said, yes. We started. And uh, the thing I noticed when I got in there right away is that nobody, nobody knows what it's like to be Jabari Parker, where everything you say and everything you do is recorded audibly and visually. And you're 18. And think about how silly and immature you were when you were 18. Just think of the stupid things you did. Think of the dumb things you said when you were 18 years old. Just think about it. And don't tell me you didn't, because you're lying. <laughs> I did a lot of that. And I've often thought how embarrassing it would be if you ever heard them or saw them on a screen. How different my life might be if you 
heard some of the things I said to my friends when I was 18. That's his life. That's his, this is his life every day when he's a freshman in college. Think of your children that are in college and imagine that mass following your child around every day. Just imagine that. Freshman here at BYU dealing with that. Fortunately, he had that guy. And uh, one of the things that happened in the course of the year that I was there, Mike's only brother, his older brother, passed away. I didn't know that at the time, but what I noticed, because I was at the, most of their games, was Mike has a routine before every game. He, Mike was in the service. He's a veteran. And he went to West Point. And so Mike is very serious about the flag, very serious about the flag. And he has a routine before every game that happens before the, the national anthem. And on this one particular day, I would always sit right across from the bench so I could watch. I'm on court side, right across from Duke's bench, because I'm watching Mike, and I'm not watching a lot of basketball. I'm watching two people. I don't care that much about the basketball stuff. I'm caring about these guys. And this particular game, I noticed Mike standing there at attention like he always does, but I noticed he had tears in his eyes. And I suspected it wasn't because of the flag, because I'd never seen him do that before, and they do the flag before every game. So I was wondering about it, and that day after the game, my wife was with me. And um, after the game, uh, my wife and I took Jabari out for dinner. And while we were walking to the car to drive him to the restaurant, I said, uh, I noticed Coach K was crying today. I said, uh, do, do you know, did something happen? And he said, uh, you didn't hear this from me, but um, his brother died. It's like two days ago. So uh, about, they went into a slump right after that. They lost three straight games, and Jabari had the worst three games of his freshman year at Duke. It, nobody knew what was going on, but it was clear like they were both in a funk. And I had a, an interview coming up with him. This is that interview uh, in his office, and I went in to see Mike, and his PR guy pulled me aside and he, before I went in. He said, do not ask him about his brother. Don't go there. The thing is, the truth is, that's the one place I wanted to go. <laughs> because what we're trying to do here is give you uh, insight into the man. Like, everybody knows he's the greatest college basketball coach since John Wooden. But he's not someone that we know well. And I think things like losing a loved one teach you a lot about a person. So uh, we got in there, and I. I didn't ask him about his brother, but I did mention that I'd noticed he was crying before the national anthem. And uh, he went there. He really went there. And he started talking about his brother and his family. And we started talking about his religious beliefs, Catholicism, which I can really relate to because I was born in the Catholic Church. And, um, and we started talking about Mormonism because that's where I am now. And he's got Jabari. And it, it was like one of the best interviews I've ever been involved in. Not because of the questions I was asking, but because of the things he was saying. Most of what he said was not precipitated by a question. It was just conversation. When I finished the story and we printed it, um, it was a cover story. And uh, whoops. Um, well, I, I just tell you that. So some really good friendships were made. Um, and Mike sent me a text message. I, I saved it. I don't save a lot of text messages. But when the story came out in Sports Illustrated, he sent me a text that said, um, now I know I can trust you. That's a text that you frame. Now I know I can trust you. Trust is like the most important thing in my job. It's the most, it can kill you the minute you don't have it. Just kill you. Um, really fast, this is my son. This is a hilarious story. But it also tells you something about character. Uh, my son's birthday fell. It's uh, March 8th, and um, six days before mine. And I had to be in Duke that night working on a post story story. So the cover story had come out. But because I had such a good relationship with the program, and had built these friendships, Sports Illustrated kept me down there to follow them through the ACC tournament and the buildup. So this game here, it's the last regular season game. It's going to be Jabari's last game of his career, his regular season game. 
and it's Duke, North Carolina, biggest rivalry in college basketball. It's been sold out since like Aristotle. You can't get in. <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, I, I, I have to bring my son because it's his birthday and I, I'm, not, I'm either not gonna be there for his birthday, which is not good, or you have to come to work with me. My son uh, doesn't even follow basketball. He doesn't even, he's not a sports guy, he's a pianist. So he's a musician, sports don't matter to him. But he likes Jabari a lot because dad's been friends with him for three years so he thinks Jabari is cool. And so he agrees to come. I don't have a ticket for him, uh, but Duke lets me get him in the building and they basically say, you'll have to figure it out from there. <laughs> and so all these kids here, the Duke crazies, uh, I've become friends with them because I sit in front of them every night and they sweat all over me um, <laughs> and get their paint on my suits. And so I'm friends with them too. And I said to the girls, I said, can you squeeze my son in? They said, sure. So there he is. And, uh, <laughs> he's wearing earplugs. It, he, he kept pulling his earplugs out going, dad, this is brutal, and sticking them back in. I said, do you know how many boys in America wish they were sitting where you are right now? <laughs> um, so anyways, I promised him something that I did not deliver on, which was one of the things I promised him was if he came to me, he'd get to meet Jabari and get his autograph. And then after the game, Jabari had the game of his life. I mean, the game of his life. And they beat North Carolina, and he was just swarmed after the game. I, I got to him to do my press work, but the, the, the kind of personal time where I could bring my son in, that didn't happen. So I, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen, and then Jabari had to go, and, and, and I had to go write a story. We had to rush back to the hotel, and I had to file a story like by midnight. So it's like, it's the deal. So we went back to the room, and it was kind of, my son got his pajamas on and went to bed, and I was very apologetic, and I felt like crap, and just like, dang, you know, it's like, this stinks when you don't do what you say you're gonna do. And um, about one in the morning, I was late getting my story filed. The editor's like, you gotta, you gotta get it. And one o'clock in the morning, my phone rings, my cell phone. It's Jabari, and he goes, what room are you in? And I said, where are you? He said, I'm in the hotel. And, uh, he said, I'm coming up. I, I get my son, I go, get out of bed. Get, get your Duke shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Jabari comes up and he spent 20 minutes in our room with my little buddy. And they talked about soda pop and what their favorite sodas are. And they talked about kids stuff. Just, he's a kid. He's a kid. And my son's definitely a kid. It was like the best birthday ever. And, uh, and then we walked him down to the car. When we went through the lobby, the security guard in the hotel literally fell out of his chair. <laughs> it's like, it's really Jabari Parker in our little tiny hotel. And uh, his parents were waiting in the van outside. His mother knew that I had made this promise to my son. And being a mom, the kind of mom she is, Lola drove Jabari over. Jabari didn't know that I had done that. His mom told him and she drove him over and that's the kind of kid he is. Um, the system, uh, Kyle Van Noy, football player here. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna talk really fast because I'm watching the clock. Um, when we agreed to write the system, um, the system grew out of the Katam Ham gang story in Sports Illustrated. And uh, I partnered with Armin because we partnered on that story and we decided to write a book together about college football. We picked eight schools that we wanted to follow through a football season. We picked Alabama, we picked Washington State, we picked Michigan, we picked Ohio State, we picked the Biggies, and we picked BYU, which is a Biggie too, but they're independent, but I, we picked BYU. And the only reason we picked BYU was because we were, at each school we were doing something different. At Alabama, we were following a coach, Nick Saban. At uh, Ohio State, you know, we're Oklahoma State, we're following a booster. Um, at Ohio State, we're following something else. Here, we wanted to follow a player who would have to make a decision whether to stay in school after his junior year or enter the NFL draft early. And there's only a few players like that in the country each year. But back then, BYU had one, Kyle Van Noy, this linebacker. And we knew that. So we looked at a short list, and I thought, well, I'll try. Let's try BYU. And I had no, like, ins here with the sports department or anything. But I came out here, and we got approval from the NCAA. We got approval from the school. And then I met with Kyle, and Kyle agreed to try it out. And so. Um, at the start of his junior year, we started doing this. 
The first game that year was against Washington State. It was here at home. And uh, ironically, I was also following Mike Leach, the new coach of Washington State, who's an alumni here. So my two people, two of the most important figures I'm going to write about in this book, Kyle Van Noy and Mike Leach were on opposite sidelines here at Provo for the opening game of the football season. Before the game, I did my first interview with him. It was t uh, a day before the game. We sat out here on the practice field at BYU, and I knew that Kyle had been arrested for drunk driving in his senior year of high school. Uh, I knew that because it was everybody knew that. And uh, very well publicized here. It almost cost him his chance to come here. So that was, that was out there. Um, I had no intentions of bringing that up in the first interview because, I mean, what, you, what are you going to ask him to just tell you what you already know? And it's also not a good way to get started. And so I'm asking him background and all this other stuff. Well, we eventually got to the question of why did you come here and all that, which led to the arrest and the drunk driving thing. And I was thinking we'll just kind of quickly gloss over that and get to other things that I don't know about and I need to know. And he, but he said to me, there's more to that story than you know. And uh, of course, that made me curious. And that's uh, number three. You have to be uh, endlessly curious in this job. You know, uh, it's a good quality to have in life. Not everybody is curious. In fact, most people are not curious about life. They're only uh, interested in their own little cocoon of life. Um, life's a lot more interesting when you're curious about, like, everything else going on in the world uh, around you. And uh, it's, it's something you can't teach journalism students. You know, when they say, what do you teach your students at SVU? Well, I don't teach them curiosity because you either have it or you don't. There's no book for that. It's, like, it's the same thing with trust and judgment, non-judgment. Those are not skills that you can teach from a textbook. You can't really pass those on to someone. You just, you have to have them or you don't. And um, I was curious when he said that, and then he told me this story, which I'll give you the Reader's Digest version, which was he got arrested for drunk driving. He went to a jail. Uh, someone at the jail leaked his name to the newspaper. They should have never done that because he was a juvenile when he got arrested. But someone uh, knew he was a famous, the best athlete in Nevada. It ends up on the front page of the Nevada newspapers. BYU finds out about it on the eve of signing day. And so Bronco Mendenhall calls him up and notifies him that BYU is going to have to withdraw the scholarship because he's violated the honor code before he even got here. The good news is we're going to release you from your commitment and you can sign somewhere else. And Kyle says, I don't want to go anywhere else. You know, he could have gone to Oregon and competed for a national championship, probably started as a freshman. He could have gone to UCLA. He could have gone to Colorado. He could have gone anywhere in the Pac-12. He could have gone to Nebraska. All of them wanted him. And all of them would have taken him regardless of a drunk driving arrest, which in college football is not a big deal. It's just not a big deal. Um, and so he wants to come here, and he's insistent. And finally, Mendenhall says, well, we're going to, the only way you could come here after he meets with Tom Homo and the dean is you'd have to have a year on probation where you prove that you can live by the honor code, and, and then we could offer you the scholarship. And so they make the deal. And then he says, this is the part that nobody knows. He said, a month later, I had another run-in with the police. And he said, I was asleep on a park bench. I'd fallen asleep on a park bench late at night in Reno. I'd been out with friends. And I, when he woke up, there were police officers and sirens in the park. And you know, when you wake up to that in the night and you're somewhere you're not supposed to be, I think the natural instinct is to run. And when you run from the police, they chase. It's, that's a natural instinct for a police officer. When someone's running away, you run after them. You don't know what the heck's going on, but you run. Everybody's running. No one knows why. <laughs> and Kyle ran away, and they eventually stopped him uh, by pulling out their taser guns. And uh, Kyle ends up back at the jail. It's a month later. But the thing that's different is no one leaks at this time because they know better. So it's not in the newspaper. So nobody knows. Most importantly, BYU doesn't know. And they're never going to find out. They're never going to find out. He's still a juvenile. So he knows and his parents know, but no one else knows. Like people at church don't even know. Nobody knows. What does this kid do? He gets on an airplane unannounced and flies up here to Provo from Reno and knocks on, walks across campus wearing a backpack on a, on a cold, wintry day in Provo. And walking across the campus, he got emotional. He told me, he said, I don't fit in here. I'll never fit in here. I don't look like people here. 
and my life has been a lot different than the kids who come here. And he walks into the Mendenhall's office, Coach Mendenhall's office, knocks on the door and says, uh, Mendenhall, he's like, Kyle, what are you doing here? And the minute he saw him, he could tell it wasn't good. And Kyle sat down and he told him the whole story. He admitted everything. And he expected the coach to tell him, now you definitely can't come here. And instead, Bronco put his arms around him. Uh, thought of a Jeff Holland story he just read about redemption. And uh, he called Tom Homo and the dean and said he wanted to keep this kid. And they said, you're crazy. You're crazy. It's happened twice in a month. And Bronco's response, of course, was, and we wouldn't know if he hadn't have told us. There's a lot of lesson in that. And so he came. And Bronco said, that's why I gave you a year. That's why I gave you a year. Bronco, he came here, he played four years. He uh, never touched alcohol again. Was one of the best football players to ever play here. It's a great story. It's one of the best stories in the system. I've been all over this country talking on college campuses and everybody says their favorite chapters in the system are the BYU chapters. I can't tell you, I had one of the best athletic directors at one of the biggest football schools in the country. I was in his truck. I won't tell you who he is because he, he doesn't want me to ever tell who it is, but we were driving in his truck and he said, if I could hire one coach to coach our football team, it would be Bronco Mendenhall. If I told you the school, you'd die. I mean, and it was because of the stories he read about him in the system and what he did. Um, there's, uh, we don't need to, we're gonna skip Ziggy. It's too bad because it's a great story, but we gotta close with this story. Uh, I'll do it fast and then we'll do a couple questions and I'm out of here. Um, when the system came out, by the way, I met Ziggy Ansa while I was following Kyle around and, and I'll just tell you that the first time I saw him, um, I was, uh, I don't know if I can get it to go back there. The first time I saw him was at that first BYU game against Washington State and I was reading over the roster and I saw all these kids from Utah and Idaho and all this stuff and I saw a kid from Ghana. And I had just been to Ghana working on Tito Momin's biography about becoming a Christian. So I knew Ghana well enough to know that they don't, they don't play football over there. And, um, <laughs> but they play a lot of soccer, and I figured BYU has got themselves a heck of a kicker uh, who's come over here. <laughs> then this guy walked out of the locker room, and I said, holy mackerel, there's no way this guy's a kicker. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, anyways... That year that I was following Kyle around, halfway through the season, your nose tackle blew out his knee. He got thrown in. He played six games, and, um, and I was here. And so I called my editor at Sports Illustrated, and I said, you know, I'm talking to all these NFL scouts that are following Kyle around, and they're talking like this guy could get drafted in the first round. He's only played five games. And my editor's going, You're in, that's nuts. Like, that's impossible. I can't have, the guy doesn't even know how to put his helmet on. And, um, and so uh, we ended up writing this story. It was one of my favorite stories that I ever did for Sports Illustrated. And it is a, it is a total BYU story. Like, it's a story that can only happen here. And uh, Ziggy's become a great friend. Uh, I wrote a training camp story about him. But while the, when the system came out, because of Ziggy and Kyle and the Bronco stuff, we had more chapters in, in the system about BYU than any other school. It just worked out that way. And uh, they're great chapters. And so when the book tour started, I came to Utah, because we also have Utah in the book. And there's even a chapter about the Utah-BYU rivalry. So the first stop on the publicity tour was Armin went to Alabama, because I was one of his schools, and they sent me to Utah. And I was here for, it was the week of the Utah-BYU game. That's, that's, you know, that's where we started. So I got off the plane uh, three days before the game, and I'm going to go right over to Salt Lake City and do all these radio and TV promos for the book. When I'm coming through the airport, though, I'm picking up the newspaper, take a peek at the sports page, and there's stories all over the Tribune and the Deseret News about BYU's kicked this kid named Spencer Hadley off the football team. I was thinking, holy cow, they kicked him off for the rest of the year? This kid's a senior. Like, what could he have possibly done to deserve something so harsh? And um, there was all this speculation on the radio that he, you know, he'd done this and done that, but nobody really knew. And then um, a day later, somebody leaked a photograph. You know, that was taken on a cell phone of him in a nightclub in Las Vegas with women that don't have much on and everybody's got booze in their hands. And Spencer's in the middle of it. Now, now everybody thinks they really know what happened. 
no wonder he's kicked off the team. Uh, at least that's what you think if you, if you live here. Um, well, that night I was doing a radio show with Bronco, and after the show, Bronco said to me, he goes, you know, um, our game is Saturday, but um, Friday night, he said, I'm taking my team to a prison in Draper. And he said, I know last year when you were here following us around to write the book, you wanted to go with us because we do this once a year, and I know you couldn't go. I'm just telling you, you could come in my, as my guest if you want to come this year, just, you know, just to come. And I said, yeah, okay, I, maybe I'll do that. And so Friday night came, and I said, ah, I'm not going to do that. I'm staying up at Little America. I don't feel like driving to Provo to then drive up to Draper, then to drive back to Provo to drive back to the hotel. I'm just going to sit at the pool and take a break. I'm tired. And uh, so I'm literally in my bathing suit sitting at the pool at Little America. It's like 85 degrees. I'm like, this is great. The first time I've sat down in three years. And um, <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I started thinking, Ugh, I should probably I probably should go because you never know when you, if you don't show up at something, you might miss something. And so I got out of my swimming suit, grabbed my clothes, got in the car, raced down to the Holiday Inn Express in Orem, and I got there just in time to get on the bus to go to the prison. And the guy's about to shut the bus door, and right before he closes the door, Spencer Hadley gets on the bus and sits down in the, I was in the front row because there were no seats left on the bus. I was the last guy on. So Spencer took the other side of the front row. We are both sitting alone. I didn't say anything to him. I never met Spencer when I was here for a year following Kyle and Ziggy around in Bronco. I'd, I'd never even said hi to him. I knew who he was because he's a good player, but I had no relationship with him. And I didn't want to bother him because I figured this kid's got, you know. But I could hear all the teammates whispering, you know, Spencer's on the bus. And they were surprised he was on the bus because he kicked off the team. I was surprised. Him. So we go to this prison. This is uh, Spencer right here. He's a guy looking at his text messages. Um, by himself. We go into the prison, there's three football players that have been pre-selected to talk to inmates. There's 120 inmates who are all incarcerated because of substance abuse related crimes. So these are guys who uh, are, have lost their wives and children, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their respect, and they've lost their liberty. They're, they're confined to a jail. They wear prison clothes. And um, I'll be honest with you, I was thinking, what in the world could three clean-cut 20-year-old BYU kids say to these guys, nothing, nothing. And you know, that's kind of how it was. They did not connect with these guys. They gave nice speeches, but it's like their reference points are here and these guys are here. And you could just tell, although they did a good job, there was no connection with these guys. And then Bronco got up, and he made more of a connection because he'd been doing this every year, and he's got more life experience, and he knew how to talk to the inmates, and it was better. And then he took some questions at the end, and that was interesting, and the guys were, you know, hey, coach, I'm third and long. Have you thought about doing the, you know, all that kind of stuff? And, um, and then this guy put his hand up, and he said, hey, um, last question, hand up. Coach, um, you know, probably half of us in here are Utah fans, and probably half of us in here are BYU fans. But tomorrow, I think it's safe to say, we're all going to be rooting for you. Because you're the only ones who come in here every year and talk to us. Nobody else does that. Big round of applause, all the inmates clapping. Great, right? So Bronco's done. He turns around. And say, all the inmates are out here, and the team is all on the stand. So they're facing each other. Got all these players are sitting up here. And I was sitting with the guys in the back row, or second of the back row. He turns to sit down. This thing's over. Right? It's done. He turns to sit down, and this inmate in the very back row stands up and shouts out, put Hadley in. Like, tomorrow in the game. These guys have no idea. They, they read the news because they, they're in prison. There's not, they, they, they know what's going on in the news because they watch TV. There's not a lot else they can do. They know Hadley's been suspended. They know about the picture. And his college career is over. But what they don't know is Hadley's actually here. They don't know he's in the room. So Mendenhall turns around and finds Hadley, makes eye contact with Hadley. And I can see this. The inmates can't because he's got his back to the inmates now. But he mouths the words to Spencer, do you want to say something? He mouthed it. So he didn't actually say it, but do you want to say something? Hadley stands up. 
Now, he hasn't, neither he nor BYU has said anything publicly about any of this stuff since the scandal started. Hadley gets up and approaches the lectern, and of course, I'm thinking, what in the world is he going to say? And he comes up to the lectern, and um, at first he takes a long pause, and then he, uh, he's got his head down, and then he says, um, I've been reading a lot in the Bible this week about redemption. And um, he said, I did something bad, really bad, a week ago. And it, as a result, it has brought a lot of shame and embarrassment to my school and my team, my church, and my family. But I'm not a bad guy. I did something bad, but I'm not a bad guy. And there is amazing power in that, those two sentences. I did something bad but I'm not a bad guy. And then he said, and I suspect that most of you are not bad guys. And now he had everybody. He could do something with those guys that those other players couldn't do. He could go somewhere with them that they couldn't go because he'd been somewhere that was similar to where they'd been. What made him different with, with them was in his case, Anybody in America who pays attention to college football knows what he did. Those guys in the cell, there's a few people that know. Their families know, which is a big deal. But you don't know. You don't even know these guys. Everybody knows who he is because he's a linebacker at BYU. So uh, I could not, when he got done, he got an unbelievable standing ovation. The inmates were all crying. They all had tears in their eyes. It was it's guys with tattoos and you know scars, physical scars and other kinds of scars. All had tears in their eyes, all up, all yelling, BYU, BYU. It was like, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life inside this prison. There was a guy sitting behind me, an African-American guy in a prison uniform, uh, meaning uh, I could tell he was a worker and he was, a big dude, and he was bawling. And so was I. And I turned around and I said, I've never seen anything like this. And he goes, you want to know what's really crazy? He said, um, this was an ESPN game, the Utah game, ESPN was broadcasting it. And he said, the crazy thing is ESPN had asked special permission to come here tonight and be here with their cameras, and they didn't show up. They could have had all this. This could have been on Sports Center." And I said, uh, well, Sports Illustrated showed up. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best story I ever wrote for the magazine. Um, it's my favorite one. My favorite one. I wrote it in one night. My Jabari stories took six months. I wrote this story in one night in a hotel room in New York without any sleep, because I couldn't sleep. It was just such a powerful story. And uh, the day that uh, we got off the bus that night when we got back to the Holiday Inn Express, and I said to Spencer, um, I introduced myself, and I said, I wanna, if you'd be willing, I want to write your story. He agreed, and he, uh, he said, when? I said, like, tomorrow. He said, where do you want to meet? And I, uh, I said, you tell me. And he said, why don't we meet at the football office? And I said, Let's, that's not a good idea, because you're BYU wouldn't want you to tell me this story. But it's going to be a good story. And they'll like it when it comes out. Better not to ask. Just trust me. <laughs> I know how these guys work. Um, so he didn't ask his coach. And I said, I'll see you in the morning. I'll be at your house. This is the day of the Utah game. It's a Saturday morning. I go home that night after the jail, and I sat up and I wrote 25 questions. If we had time, if you were students, I'd ask you, if you were a journalist about to go do this interview, what's the first question you're going to ask Spencer? It's a very important question. We don't have time to do it. I'll tell you what it is. The number one question on the list is, can I talk to your mom and dad? 
It's not because he's a minor, because he's not a minor anymore. He's over 21. He's a full-fledged adult. But I want them in this. This is a family thing. I want them to buy in. So that was my number one question. I showed up at Spencer's house, apartment here in Provo. I knocked on the door, and his mom answered the door. I didn't expect that. His parents had come here as soon as this whole scandal thing started. They drove from Washington, where his dad was a stake president. And I could tell the minute she opened the door, she'd been crying for four days. Brutal. Just brutal. And uh, they invited me in, and I, I told her, you know, she knew what I was there for, and uh, Spencer had told her. I told they knew I wanted to interview them. I said, but I really, I need to interview Spencer first, and I need to interview him alone. And I said, you know, could, is, is there a place you guys could go for a couple hours and then come back? And they agreed to do that. But before they left, Spent, his mother looked at me, and she, her eyes welled up, and she said, uh, I just have one request. She said, you need to promise me that you will not hurt our son any more than he's been hurt, because he's been hurt a lot. And I said, I can promise you that I won't do that. And they left. And I interviewed Spencer. And when we got to the part of the interview where I said, you need to tell me what everything you did in Vegas, he said, can we go off the record? And we went off the record. I shut the tape off. And he told me it all off the record. And then we finished the interview. And we got to the interview. I said, Spencer, listen to me. I said, I promise you I wouldn't write anything in the story that's off the record. I said, but I'm going to tell you something right now. We can't do this story without you letting me use all of that information on the record. Because we have to tell our readers what you did. Because the fact is, you're an adult. You're old enough to go to a nightclub in Las Vegas. That is not illegal. You are old enough to consume alcohol. That is not illegal. He said, in the big scheme of things, you violated no civil laws in Nevada or in America. No civil laws were violated. You didn't break a law. What you did was you did a couple things that violate an honor code at your university. Big difference. He said, if you were anywhere else in America, none of this would matter. It only matters in Provo. And it only matters in the Mormon church. It doesn't matter anywhere else because of what you did. In fact, the two things that you did, the two worst things you did, most American boys have done them over and over and over again during their college days. Not your college and not your church as much, although even there some have. But the thing is, it's because you're a Mormon and you go to BYU. I said, I'm telling you that when 21 million people read your story, they're all going to say, he got suspended for that? Jeez, I, did that. I do that all the time. <laughs> and that's not what this story is about. The story is about what you did in the jail. That's what we want to write about. To make that be more powerful, we have to do that. We did this story, wrote it in one night. It was one of the most read stories that SI has done in years, in years. And it's because the theme of redemption is something that everybody can relate to. But no, very, very few people have to have their lives, their mistakes played out in public. We're out of time. I know we got to go. That Spencer, I, that picture was just from a couple months ago. He played with the Raiders last year on the practice squad. He made it through uh, this summer. They cut him uh, just at the start of training camp this year. But he got his chance. And now he's uh, married. And uh, he's a happy guy. Great guy. St that's the stories we found in the system. It was just fabulous. I didn't get to tell you this, but this is uh, my Steve Young stuff. And I wish we had more time. I could have told you more about that. But I will just tell you, you will love watching the film about his life on the NFL Network next fall when it airs. We just finished the last shoot in Philadelphia Monday night. I cried. I cried when, we, when he did it because it was just, it was 
unbelievably powerful for this guy to sit in a studio in NFL Films in a movie theater and have them put clips on a screen this big and have him sit alone in a dark theater and watch his life. What a life. I was in the room with my daughter and I just like, unreal, an unreal life. And I think when people watch his life and they read his book, they're gonna be just so, it's, it's so unbelievably inspiring that it's, uh, it's hard to put into words. I'm lucky that I got to be a part of it. Uh, I'm out of time, sorry.